Hi there. Uh, so this is number three of my um, recordings intended to share with you all the themes in my breathing classes, workshops um, uh, and single uh, and individual lessons that are most useful when practiced regularly. And I've mentioned before in one of the previous films that I've made for YouTube that in the Final Cries, uh, we don't necessarily practice the same thing over and over again. Um, uh, in Final Cries, you're learning the process of learning. And the idea is to recognize that some of what you're doing is transferable to other things. So you take the idea of moving slowly and bring it to your piano exploration or you discover some interesting softness in your hand and then you apply that to your paintbrush or the way you hold your flute. So that's all well and good and that requires a kind of regular commitment that not everybody feels ready to make when they first come across Feldman Christ. and part of my goal is to make it clear to you how valuable it is to do Feldman Christ very very regularly to do it every day. And um, uh, when I came to Feldenkrais, I wasn't expecting to find ways to um, heal my own asthma, but that's what has happened. And not just Feldenkrais, other great practices come along, other great systems working with breathing, um, but always for me then modified and organized in a very Feldenkraisy way. So that's what I'm sharing with you now. And I will mention where I got these ideas from because uh, I, I'm always delighted if you go back and you check out the source. Um, but the idea of what I'm doing in this um, uh, third vid is for you to have more things that you can do every day so that little by little you start to build up like a nice little array of potential practices, yeah? So you don't have to do it in a robotic way or in a repetitive way, but you might wake up one morning and think, oh, I feel a bit like this kind of practice today. This is what I'd like to do. Um, because when you are a Feldenkrais practitioner, someone who practiced Feldenkrais, I'm still trying to come up with the right word for what that is. Uh, when you are doing that as regularly as possible, preferably on a daily basis, um, that's when the real benefits start to accrue, not just occur as wonderful one-off experiences, but they accrue. You start to feel a little better and a little better and a little better all the time. And um, I, as you know, I came to Feldenkrais via voice. Um, and so I've been framing these potent breath uh, films as part of my potent voice work. But actually, you know, these are obviously good for all aspects of well-being, not just the function of the voice. And what's been going on? What's been going on is in the last few years, I found something that backed up what I discovered from a Buteco breathing course I did years and years and years ago. My asthma was much worse then, and the Buteco helped me enormously. And the main reason it helped me so much was because it helped me learn to breathe through my nose. Now, my asthma came with a lot of respiratory symptoms in the nose as well. So I had an allergic rhinitis kind of thing. My nose was usually blocked. I usually breathe through my mouth. And when you breathe through your mouth habitually, you kind of open it up, make a big space at the back so it's easy to get air in. It's very drying. And none of the fabulous filtering um, processes are going on. So when the air enters your nose, it's passing through a filtering system that is moistening the air, so it's not so drying for your throat. Filtering the air, filtering out particles. Um, warming the air, so as it arrives deeper down inside you, it feels nicer and less um, like something from the outside, more like it's yours. Um, warming the air becomes much more obviously valuable on a very cold day when you notice how chilly it is to breathe in through your nose. It's still very chilly here in the UK at the moment, so nasal breathing comes with a little bit of a chill in your face, but much nicer than having a chill in your throat. I once had a, 
an asthma attack come from breathing through my mouth in an icy environment, so I know how harmful that can be. Um, yeah, so, uh, breathing through the nose uh, has all of those benefits, and then one more, and the person who talks about um, this, well, there's two, two great guys, um, uh, Patrick McCowan, who's a Buteco expert, but has gone on to specialise in working with athletes, and James Nestor, who is a very widely knowledgeable man who chose to um, investigate breathing very deeply. And there are good books about, I don't actually have McCowan's book, um, but I do have, this is a wonderful book, I recommend it wholeheartedly. Um, but for me, it wasn't so much learning new stuff as the joy of um, discovering the science behind what you know already works. And I had already found out how well it worked for me to train myself to breathe through the, breathe through the nose. Indeed, I spent 10 years sleeping with a plaster on my mouth to make myself breathe through the nose. And I only stopped when it was going to be um, a problem to do it while I was in hospital with a different issue. And I thought they would think I was weird, which of course I was weird sleeping with the plaster over my mouth for 10 years. But the reason I did it for so long was because it worked so well and I could breathe so easily through my nose overnight. It made such an enormous difference. So I discovered that I could get through the night without my plaster. And when I first started doing it, I would, I would have my hand resting on my lips just softly. And that would help me feel confident enough that I would remember to keep my mouth closed. And um, uh, I, once I stopped using the plaster, I never went back to it and I found that I could breathe much, much better over it. But I would probably say, um, and this is something James Nestor talks about in his interviews on YouTube a lot, um, I would probably say I was still very mouth breathy. And actually, you know, it's natural to breathe through the mouth when you sing and it's natural to breathe through the mouth when you talk. So here, if I stop and try and breathe through my nose, that's going to be noisy and weird. So I'm not going to do that. Um, so yeah, so breathing through my nose more, breathing through my nose through the day, that became a very useful thing to figure out how to master. And um, uh, the person I learnt the most useful strategy from is a man called Martin Jones, and he teaches something that he calls holographic breathing. And I'm going to share uh, that with you now. That's the first thing I'm going to do. And he's got um, his own channel on YouTube. All of these wonderful teachers are uh, have great stuff up on YouTube for you to follow up. So I will make sure their names are in the, um, uh, the about section below so you can find more information if you would like it. But this is my take on holographic breathing with some nods to James Nestor and some nods to Patrick McCown. So uh, I'm going to do this sitting up. You can do this lying down. Um, my teacher recommends that you do this sitting up so you don't fall asleep. I have a different take on this. You see, I think you've got your life to master it and what you might need more is the sleep. So if you are having a go at this and you're lying down and you drift off, just rewind and start again another time, but that sleep will be doing you a lot of good as well. So that's my take on the sleeping thing. I um, have only in the last few years started to have a handle on my own chronic fatigue. And for me, it was invaluable to have things I could practice lying down. And a lot of the great meditation stuff out there kind of insisted that you had to sit up and I just wasn't well enough to do that when I started practicing those practices. So I'm going to say if you feel like lying down and you want to try this lying down, you do it lying down. I'm going to do it sitting up. And there is one element, I think I've mentioned this before, when you are doing breathing work sitting up, then what um, uh, is significant about that is that's the evolved creature we are. Yeah, of the relationship of our diaphragmatic movement, of the way our whole self is organised, is vertical in gravity. We may spend a long time sleeping, but it's not what we evolved to do. Sleeping is just a good 
side effect of being a, a mammal and um, uh, not really uh, something you evolved to do in a particular way um, compared to how valuable it is to be able to breathe freely and fluidly and openly while you're standing up, while you're sitting up. Um, I didn't put that very well. I probably should get rid of that for now. <laughs> I may have another go at this recording sometime. But I'm going to keep going now. So gently um, close your lips, bring your lips so they're touching and touching very softly. So it's not, you don't have to press them together. You're just letting the inner edges touch. And just do a couple of breaths through your nose, but feeling your lips. Just notice the sensation. What it feels like that your lips are touching. Is it possible for your lips to stay soft while you inhale? And then you might even be able to see if I think about drawing the air in through my nostrils on purpose, they flare slightly. You get this opening, you get this readiness to draw the air in, this welcoming action in the nostrils. Do you feel that opening process? And then do it a little on purpose. So your lips are closed and you're intentionally drawing the air through your nostrils and you're intentionally opening the nostrils to embrace the air as it comes in and you're feeling the coolness of the air inside your nostrils. Now when you organise yourself like this, so your lips are softly closed, your jaw is usually not, your, the two parts of your jaw, upper and lower, not usually very far from each other. But for most people they won't be touching, yeah? They'll be close to each other but they won't be closed. So I, we're going to now play with a movement of the jaw that opens and closes. But it's not that you have to close your teeth all the way to shut. And it's not um, that you open them very large, you don't make a wide gap, you don't put any pressure on your lips to open. But what you do do is you rest your tongue as close to your palate as you can bring it. Start with the tip behind your upper teeth on the ridge there. There's a ridge inside your mouth behind your upper teeth called the alveolar ridge. It's the place where you say n and d and t. Let your tongue rest there, the tip of your tongue. Close your lips, breathe in through your nose. Do a few breaths and see if while you're breathing you can begin to relax your tongue so that it fills up more of this internal space. It's already very close to your palate with your lips closed. So unless you have a habit of pulling the tongue away from the palate, it's probably going to be quite easy to allow it to settle somewhere on your Behind that ridge, there's a dome. And can you let at least some of your tongue settle up into that dome so you can feel the surface of the roof of your mouth with the upper surface of your tongue? So your nostrils are opening, your lips are closed, your tongue is as much on your palate as you can comfortably allow. And then begin this opening of the jaw like one or two millimeters as you breathe in. And closing the same amount that it opened. So back to your neutral position for your jaw when you breathe out. So when you breathe in. And you breathe out. And as you breathe in, your jaw opens a little. Your tongue stays on your palate. So do a few of those, get the feeling of it. I'll keep describing it so you don't have to try and remember everything too intently. Your tongue is on your palate. Comfortably, not pressed, just comfortably. Your lips are closed. The 
until it opens on the in-breath. This is what Martin Jones calls holographic breathing, the soft opening of the jaw on the in-breath, closing on the out-breath. I'm going to compare it to what we do in Feldenkrais with our hands a lot. We do this soft opening of the hands and closing of the hands. We do it in lots of different organisations and in lots of different ways, but we call it the bell hand. So let's think of this opening of the jaw as the bell jaw, the jaw softly opening on the in-breath, closing on the out-breath, a gentle oscillation, very low pressure. Except that what I'm hoping you can feel is the way that when the jaw pulls down slightly, if your tongue stays on the palate, you get the feeling as if the tongue is slightly suctioned to your upper palate. This feeling. This is the posture of the tongue that, unless there's some neurological issue, we're born with. We're born with the tongue. You can see underneath there, settling on the palate, and to get it to come away, you get this sound. You get that click. I mentioned the click in previous recordings, but I think this is the first time I've gone into detail about this jaw. So that once you get the jaw rhythm going, you can feel the way the tongue actually creates this um, downward pull, very subtle, on the palate. But what that can do for those of us who do have to deal with respiratory issues, I was great uh, right over the winter, but now it's tree pollen time and I am back to being sneezy girl. Um, when my nose blocks up, I can have the tongue against the palate and when it pulls in this suction -y way when I open my jaw, I can open the back of my nose. It makes it easier to clear the blockages. It makes it easier to keep breathing through my nose even in difficult circumstances, even when I'm reacting to something in my body. So I'm going to describe that whole pattern again. I'm going to add a couple more things. When you flare your nostrils, you might find that you can activate your upper lip and I'm going to exaggerate it. It, it can actually curl. You don't have to do that every time, but there's something very enlivening for the face and the lips when we find this activity in the upper lip. Now there's another woman I'm going to mention, I'm going to mention Paula Garborg, no longer with us, wrote a book called The um, Secrets of the Wing Muscles, and I was fascinated by the sphincters. I will be talking more about sphincters as time goes on, but um, what was interesting for me was that she mentioned that this lip, upper lip movement wasn't easy for people with asthma. And lo and behold, at the time I was reading the book, when it went first, I couldn't do it. I had to practice to get good at it and getting better at it. Can't claim cause and effect, but what I can say is there's been a kind of ongoing improvement in both my asthma and my ability to activate this little curling action of the upper lip. So that goes with the nostril flare and can go with this feeling of the tongue creating, as I say, it's like a feeling of suction. You know that you can, you can get that click if you were to pull the tongue away abruptly. A soft opening and closing of the jaw can be very, very nice for, first of all, if you wake up in the night, just practicing this can get you back into a very soothed state and ready to go off to sleep again. But 
I had a lot of funny, I had a clicky jaw, jaw I'd sometimes wake up and my jaw would have gone into a kind of spasm. I used to have a, a click on one side of my larynx. All of those things have cleared up since I started practicing them. Now I practiced it in a very dedicated way because I knew how beneficial it was going to be for my health to breathe through my nose more effectively, more efficiently and more reliably. So I stuck with it and you know I do, I do wake up in the night so it's very useful for me to have something to do that isn't worrying about what I'm supposed to do the next day or things I've forgotten to do that day. So it's a good distraction and um, <clears throat> there's another thing that I think I've mentioned a bit but I'm going to mention it again now because it's really relevant. James Nestor and Patrick McCowan both talking about the value of um, breathing through the nose and uh, Nestor in particular talking about the tongue on the palate and the, and the relevance of the tongue on the palate and how that can open up. Over time, this sort of structural organisation of the face make it easier to breathe, widening the face, improving the organisation of the upper jaw. Obviously not immediately, it takes a little time, but it's a, a very powerful practice for improving the whole organization of your facial structure. You can feel this lovely um, uh, opening of the passages when you practice it, it's really worth doing. But what James Nestor pointed out, and I already sort of figured this out thinking about Stephen Porges' polyvagal theory, but what Nestor was saying was, look, if you breathe into your nose and then hum when you breathe out and you do that for about five minutes every day it's beneficial for your health it's beneficial for your immune system so you've got this first of all you're practicing the nasal breathing which is always good but secondly you've got this thing where when you are breathing through your nose um, you trigger a, a, a an enormous increase in the amount of nitric oxide being generated in here and this is your pathogen killer so this is terribly useful for not just you know the pathogen du jour covid but anything that you can breathe into your nose that might go on to cause trouble if you didn't sort of deal with it quickly with your immune system so this is a real boost to the immune system and his suggestion is five minutes so five minutes of breathing in and then humming the sound out. And I had already come up with this idea that you might have what I would call a whole tongue hum. So you can hum with your lips, mm. you can hum with the tip of your tongue, mm. you can hum with the back of your tongue, mm. sound in sing, yeah. But if you just let your tongue rest on your palate, you have what I'm calling the whole tongue hum which is and is a little like the sound that people make that's a yummy noise yeah so you've got the sound <laughs> that Homer Simpson makes when he's thinking about donuts and the whole tongue is close to the palate on the palate preferably and when you hum like this you're vibrating your skull you're vibrating um uh, all these different structures that are encasing the brain, that are involved in the flow of not just blood, but also lymph, also cerebrospinal fluid. You get this kind of lovely vibrator energy going on in your face. And it's actually not at all weird to know that you get health benefits from it. So there's a wonderful um, uh, Bill Withers song that begins with hum, lean on me. And that works very well, you know, breathing through your nose and then Yeah, quite a long time there before I ran out of air. It's a great way to extend your out breath. And extending your out breath is part of the benefit, I'm sure, of this nitric oxide generation and this vibratory effect. But we also know from Stephen Porges that it brings you more and more deeply into your parasympathetic.
diabetic rest and recuperate function. Now, I am absolutely certain that these type of things kind of overlap and interweave and you can't isolate one benefit from the other. Humming is benefiting all of these things. There's a reason why chanting and toning and singing together and all of these things have been popular for millennia. And that's the theme of James Nestor's book is look, here's a is something that we have known is beneficial for millennia, but now there's science to back it up. I am not someone, I, I am fascinated by the processes and what is discovered in the scientific arena. arena. I'm not someone who um, uh, thinks that's the only way to know stuff. So I, I think that there's a, an absurd arrogance to assuming that something that humans have been doing for 2000 years needs proving. Nevertheless, that's the way our culture functions. And so it might not need proving, but it's obviously very helpful that it can be proven. So, but I am absolutely 100% for you proving it to yourself like I've done for myself. My asthma is massively better. And massively better, bearing in mind that I had for more than 10 years been sleeping with the plaster of my mouth. So I had been doing a lot of nasal breathing overnight. It didn't have the same benefit as this interaction between tongue, palate, nostrils, lips, jaw. And uh, I can't say for sure whether it's why my jaw has stopped being problematic and why I no longer have a click in my larynx. I'm not certain that that's what did it. How would I know? I'm just, you know, there's no control when you're practicing on yourself. There's only how do I feel today compared to yesterday. Instead, what I encourage you to do is look for what's enjoyable, what's pleasant to do, what doesn't feel like an effort to practice and take that on. And that's what I have found with this is it's a joy to do. So there is more. I'm not sure how long I've been going on for now. Ha ha ha. There isn't a timed thing on here and I haven't been timing it like a twit. Um, so. Let's recap, and I'm going to add one more thing, which is that you are going to observe your breathing by gently placing your hands. Here's where your um, pelvic bones are. Gently placing your hands there. Now, um, I'm going to sit down again so you can't see them very well. I'm going to tilt my, yeah, I'm going to tilt my screen. Maybe all this is going to help. There we go. That's it. So, hands there, and then as you breathe in through your nose and your tongue rests on your palate and your lips stay closed and perhaps a little lively, your jaw opens. Feel how you can feel the breath down here, expanding your abdomen as your lungs fill. So, you can, you'll see it. It's very small, but you'll see it. You can, if you look at my elbows, you might see it more easily. So I've got very, very interested in how direct this is. When you breathe through your nose this way, diaphragm moves in such a clear, easy way, expands the lungs, and the whole abdomen responds by its being mobile. Excuse me, for I'm just going to pause. Okay, I'm back. So, so yes, yeah, so the other thing I've had... Um, I think I, I put in one of the previous recordings, so you can do is just observe the movement here. But what's interesting is how immediate it is. The air comes in through the nose, you feel the expansion straight away. So um, Martin, Jones points, Martin Jones points out that when you do lower your jaw, you get this uplift in your chest. Not very subtle. Yeah, your, your breathing mechanisms come all the way, sorry, breathing mechanisms, wrong way to put it. Your lungs, are, you know, you've even got some lung tissue all the way up here. It's a long way up, um, not very much compared to the amount there is down there. But what you're looking for, obviously, is an easy flow of air in and out, a sense of effortless continuation. And that's what comes very nicely with this process. But this here, 
it shows you how nice and feely you are breathing throughout the whole torso. So I mentioned in, I think it's um, Potent Breath 2, I mentioned Om, real classic um, sound that involves one vowel morphing into another and that gives you the shift in overtones that can be a nice um, thing to play with when you're chanting. And then ending with the lips closed, hum, oh, oh. Got a lot of potential in it. Nice sound to play with. You may already be familiar with it as it's so well known. Um, I'm going to leave you with uh, a different kind of sound to play with. It's the sound of um, uh, a bee being sustained. Now, there's all kinds of sounds we naturally sustain. It's easy to sustain vowels. Ah, they're designed to be sustained. It's easy to sustain an S. S it's what's called a fricative. It's less easy but possible to sustain the sound th. th, th. It's not very steady, it's not very even, but you'll feel, th, you'll feel your breathing boot up to help you sustain a sound like th. Um, and any of these sounds can have a voiced version, so it could be th. th, th. Um, the B is very similar in that it really does not immediately give you a sustainable sound. You have to play with it a bit. But be it, it sets up a really intense, I can feel it in my ears already, yeah? It, it sets up an intense vibration in the whole of your it's really intensifying for the um, structures that stabilise your breath and react to what happens when you create extra breath pressure. Yes, I'm creating some pressure and everything's going to help me do that. I'm going to feel it down here very easily. And as I continue, I can feel the back of my head vibrating. Essentially, I am thoroughly recommending this as a sound to play with, to stimulate and enliven yourself and then when you run out of air, the lips are almost closed so it doesn't take much to let them relax, close, let the air come in through your nose and then go back to your So I'm going to leave you with that sound to play with and to, um, you, it's just a very enlivening sound, it gets everything buzzing. So um, I'm going to leave it there and there will be a part four, hopefully not too long, not with such a long gap as uh, I think the other two in November, so this is a much longer gap than I intended, but uh, I will be back with more soon. Until then. Have fun buzzing away.